Hello everyone, I hope you've been well. Um, today I just want to have like sort of a, another informal sort of uh, ramble, I suppose. I think I actually prefer the informal sort of rambles for my videos and then the more sort of well-sourced formal style for my articles on the blog. Uh, I suppose it is whatever people find most few, uh, useful and of course your input is always greatly appreciated. But, uh, but um, uh, as the title of this video um, indicates, today I plan on just sort of talking about the uh, Spanish Civil War and probably more specifically the um, anarchist societies in Catalonia and Aragon. I want to say Aragon, I hope it's pronounced like that, but otherwise I may just be spouting the name of a Lord of the Rings character. I haven't heard it actually said out loud, I do not believe. Probably actually I have, um, yeah. But anyway, my main sort of sources for my sort of rambles, like the main stuff I've read, well, there's a bunch of stuff about the Spanish Civil War on, um, and the anarchists there, um, on Libcom. I think uh, I've read a f few bits and bobs. Um, another was a discussion with, um, that was held between socialism or barbar uh, barbarism and, and someone else, I can't remember who. And then I read through the resources that he provided. I think most of those were on Libcom. And uh, it's not just Libcom, don't worry. I have also read um, The Spanish Civil War by Hugh Thomas. And I've read a couple of books about the uh, Welsh miners and uh, their sort of joining of the international brigades and their relation to the Spanish Civil War, so that includes like the hosting of refugees, uh, Republican refugees, and uh, uh, the gathering and sending of aids, but that focuses, yeah, that's more of a broad thing, and then also more specifically to the communist international brigades. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I've also uh, another resource I can recommend is sort of um, the channel, YouTube channel Punks for Protests. They have a documentary. Uh, it's in three parts. Each part is about an hour and 40 minutes long and then it sort of discusses the Spanish Civil War in its entirety. And then there's a few smaller videos across YouTube that I've watched as well. And of course I've probably seen mentions of it because it is quite a popular example of an anarchist society in like works such as a uh, um, anarchy works and uh, an anarchist FAQ. So anyway, um, I'll now sort of proceed with this discussion. And I, uh, the main thing I want to talk about is um, one thing I, I think is quite remarkable is how successful the anarchists in um, Sp Sp uh, Catalonia were, and uh, and in Aragon as well. And then uh, how they actually. Most of their problems didn't seem to be um, as a result of any sort of internal problems of anarchism and how they mainly seemed to be um, most of the, well, the, the eventual fall of the Spanish anarchists was a result of um, uh, external influences. And it was this sort of seeing how the anarchist sort of syndicalist, uh, anarcho syndicalist, uh, syndicalist, I suppose is the best way to phrase it, anarcho syndicalist uh, way of running things, um, particularly in Barcelona, bettered working conditions, and it was generally welcomed by the majority of the, uh, well, pretty much the entirety of the working class population, aside from those who maybe supported the um, communists and the um, the larger socialist party. And, um, of course, uh, was also popular amongst the peasants in Aragon. I don't like saying peasants because I always feel a bit like, um, like I'm nobility looking down on those peasants, as it were. But, uh, no, of course, that is probably, it is an acceptable term, so, and I think it's the most well understood, so I'll continue to use that. But, yeah, I sort of started to learn about the Spanish Civil War, uh, Civil War and, um, of course, the anarchist, uh, particularly into Catalonia, as I was sort of just being introduced to um, 
anarchism. Um, it would have been just after I found um, some of non-competes videos in anarchism and I started looking into it. I'm not too certain as to where the um, uh, where I first heard it mentioned. I, I, I believe I'm going to say it was probably uh, Anarchy Works, um, but um, I uh, it may have been briefly mentioned in one of non-competes videos and that's where I may have learnt more about it. Or it could have even been um, Libertarian Socialist Rants and his videos. Yes, I think that is actually um, uh, where I first probably heard it. Libertarian Socialist Rants, I believe he, he mentioned it multiple times. And I think the particular book he mentioned was um, Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell. And that, that was quite... I found it quite beautiful. Because although the majority of the book, like... Well, it's a great book all throughout, and so, uh, though, of course, some of what uh, George Orwell said wasn't necessarily the most accurate or the best explained, and it sort of just came from his position of being in this very chaotic, confusing situation, and then some people have the benefit of being able to look outside, have access to the broad range of information, and have the benefit of hindsight, um, are able to sort of point out some errors in George um, Orwell's recollections, but um, I think his uh, descriptions of Catalonia were quite inspiring to me, like sort of the idea of like this there's the one place where like the working class weren't being sort of uh, so, uh, oppressed and sort of they, they were empowered and then everyone was sort of coming together as equals and then they were all sort of really proud of what they'd accomplished like there were signs in the barber shops and um stuff like that and i found that um really um sort of quite inspiring uh and yeah i think sort of i uh, when i started to learn about anarchism i was looking into a lot of um case studies to see how it works because um well, uh, yeah, I think I'm just the type of person who really benefits from sort of looking at case studies and seeing how um, theory is put into practice and whether or not it's successful, and I like to base my judgments on that. And then I think it really did sort of uh, make it beneficial. I would sort of like to talk about the collectives, and I think I'll probably talk about the uh, collectives before I talk about the more sort of Catalonia, like that I'm talking about the peasant collectors. I'll talk about the peasant collectors, probably might discuss the militia a bit, and then I'm also going to discuss um, Catalonia. Uh, I think I'm going to start with the collectives because sort of, well, uh, it's the area that I know least the least amount, though I'm looking into soon reading, um, uh, I forget the name of the book, but it's by Sam Dolgolf, or Dolgolf, I'm not too certain, but that's been recommended to me on multiple occasions. Uh, but yeah, the anarchist collectives um, were sort of formed as uh, the the anarchist militia uh, led the sort of Aragon sort of front. Yeah, so probably actually the militia is the best place to start, so I can explain. Um, so yeah, I'll start with the war aspect. Uh, aspect. Basically... Um, there was a coup started by the, uh, I'm going to assume you have a brief knowledge, but I'm just going to recollect, and then, uh, I would advise looking up on your own things if you're unsure, if you don't know. It's not too important, I suppose, but, um, yes, so the, um, Spanish Civil War started when the Nationalists, uh, which mostly consisted of the military, um, as well as, um, the fascists and, um, Catholic conservatives, um, across Spain, and uh, particularly the uh, middle classes, um, and the um, landowners, and of course industrialists, sort of the wealthy um, in general, but it was the main driving force of the coup was of course the military, and they sort of, uh, all across they had this um, spontaneous sort of coup. Uh, the f nationalists were eventually led by Franco, but as the coup was sort of starting, this was uh, more unclear and stuff still had to be decided. Um, uh, fa uh, uh, Franco only consolidated his power later, but I, I don't really want to focus too much on the broad history and want to focus more specifically on the anarchists. Um, but yes, yeah, so anyway, um, as part of this coup, um, the soldiers in various cities would uh, basically take over, and because uh, the, uh, the Republican government, so the Republican government was the, I think it was the Second Republic, or the, yeah, um, of Spain, 
uh, and it was sort of mostly formed of sort of, um, you know, um, liberals, well, what would be called in America liberals, and um, what would the modern, what would in modern terms be classed as social democrats, and then the, uh, the socialists didn't really get power in the government until uh, later on, but it was a popular front, so actually the socialists were sort of involved. The anarchists, um, to begin with, stayed out of the government, because of course um, a lot of anarchist literature um, does um, explain why it's not a strategically good idea, or a personally good idea, to um, try to manipulate state power, and it, why instead it's better to create alternative sources of power and to use those to dismantle the state and then replace them. But sorry, I'm, I'm going off on multiple tangents here. Uh, so yes, the nationalists, they rose up in different cities and uh, the, the Republic failed to mobilise its the, the loyal troops um, in most cities, so many important cities were lost. Um, and one exception to this, there were of course other exceptions, but the ones we're go focusing on is Barcelona which is the um, capital of uh, Catalonia, and this is where the anarchists held, uh, the anarcho-syndicalists were, so, uh, belonging to tra uh, the syndical union, the CNT, um, they, uh, they were the largest party, and they'd been sort of doing a lot of militant stuff, like general strikes for uh, decades at this point, but, um, they uh they were prepared sort of militantly to sort of send out people to fight they they didn't really have proper military training on any level but they were prepared to fight and the republican uh government failed to mobilize any troops so as these uh sort of uh, nationalist soldiers were trying to seize barcelona the um anarchists set out to sort of combat them they set up barricades and uh did various things to fort them and then uh, they eventually put a lot of pressure. I think a few of them had their own arms as well, which were used. But the main source of arms was sourced when they um, pressured the local police forces into um, giving up their supply of um, weaponry. And uh, they were able to then uh, uh, hold back the, f uh, the nationalist um, forces. Um, and they were able to do this successfully without any sort of centralised leadership. And then I think they then, I think there was a problem initially where they got a large number of rifles, but they didn't have any bolts for these rifles. So then they, um, yeah, because I think eventually the Republican government, or at least the um, Catalonian government, which was sort of a small sort of partly dissolved um, uh, government, um, like partly dissolved from the um the main government i i mean um it uh one of the two they um granted the uh, anarchist workers and it wasn't just anarchist workers there um other workers from the socialist unions and just gen uh, any i suppose other groups would have followed the anarchist lead but uh, weapons were issued to the anarchists and the other workers but uh these rifles, yeah, that, as I said, they did not have any bolts, so uh, they then had to pressure um, another officer, I think it was at a barrack, so it might have been a military as opposed to a police officer, though there was sort of a blurring between, as there always is, between the police and the military, and he refused, but they broke in and then took them all anyway, or I think he might have relented unwillingly, uh, but... Um, yeah, so then with all these arms and stuff, they drove the fascists out and then they quickly organised in a sort of militia and they actually, um, uh, this militia, the, mo what, the most sort of famous sort of figure within this militia was probably Deruti and uh, yeah, Deruti had been famous for quite some time because he was sort of known for sort of his work in uh, organising uh, anarchist events and anarchist actions, direct action and he'd been yeah, in various legal trouble with lots of different states as he travelled around the world um, avoiding arrest and then coming up with new reasons for the new, uh, the states to arrest him. And uh, I think he was greatly influenced by uh, Machno, who he uh, met in um, Paris. Um, 
Machno, um, in, in case she wasn't aware, uh, led a successful, well, uh, it eventually failed, but, of course, but, um, led an anarchist, um, militia himself in the Ukraine and liberated a bunch of, uh, Ukrainian villages and successfully, um, fought off the, the white forces in the, um, Russian Civil War until, um, Makhno and his forces were betrayed by the, um, Bolsheviks. Uh, but, um, yeah, he met at, uh, Makhno, and I think he was quite influenced by Makhno's ideals and probably experiences that maybe Makhno might have shared with him. But anyway, um, everyone followed, uh, yeah, Daruti and the militia, uh, which I'll pr quickly explain. The militias, they did have officers, but they were often, um, elected, uh, so they, in the anarchist militias at least, the officers were elected, and they were instantly recallable at, so at any point, so they would have sort of a source of quick directions under fire and stuff when there's not really time to sort of sit down and have a meeting, but, um, they, uh, uh, they were recallable, so, like, sort of after the fire was over, if they didn't like what this officer had done, if this officer had displease them in any way like let's say he was sort of taking advantage of his rank or as he, if he was found to be incapable of performing his role effectively he would be recalled and he would just be like the other soldiers and then they kind of had a looser discipline so like the officers weren't saluted and they weren't referred to as sir they were called comrade and same as anyone else and i don't believe that they had special any special privileges and then um so this militia sort of uh, pushed the uh, the nationalist forces back through the uh, through the Aragon front, and on the way um, they would sort of liberate the peasants, and they'd be sort of like, "You're free to do what you want now." They like they would explain basically anarchist organising how it would work, I assume. Uh, but a large portion of the peasants already knew how it would uh, work, and there there are anarchists in nearly every village, and then the anarch uh, they would be. Uh, collectivized and then uh, of course peasants also took their own initiative even when there wasn't a passing military uh, militia going through to um, uh, collectivize their village and the village farmlands um, but uh, yes yeah, so I'll finish up with discussing the militia the militia in Aragon was actually quite successful because as I said it drove back the nationalist forces and this was something that um, many other forces failed to do so so like the the communist militias which were quite small at this time they'll get bigger later for reasons that i'll discuss later the and the more general sort of republican led militias because the republican they, they the republic feared uh because they knew some of the soldiers who stayed loyal they only sort of stayed loyal because they were in a situation where they were uh, where the different parts of the uprising failed and succeeded they were only loyal because they were sort of cut out uh, uh, off from the um, the rest of the nationalist forces. So instead of mobilizing any soldiers, the Republic um, decided to um, train new soldiers uh, to lead under a professional uh, army. But until then, they um, decided to to keep uh, to sort of have militias. But in in the uh, in most of the areas. The um, militias were badly beaten by the nationalists. Uh, this was, of course, because um, the militias were mostly untrained, uh, whereas um, the uh, it was uh, the main forces used by the nationalists at this uh, point in the war were the um, troops from the Foreign Legion in Morocco. So they had um, they had combat experience many years, and they were professionally trained. Went through regular training, and of course, you can see how. They then, simply because, you know, the term practice makes perfect, they would have had an advantage over the um, untrained militias who, who who wouldn't have had military experience and didn't really know how combat worked. I don't think this was an issue of discipline. That's sort of one thing that um, always gets pushed on the uh, failure of the militias is that they were quite undisciplined. While this is true, like, even in the non-anarchist uh, militias, uh, whereas uh, people would sort of disobey orders or not follow orders that well. Um, I don't think this was a fault, because probably if we're taking discipline to move the uh, mean sort of following a strict authoritarian hierarchy, uh, 
then the anarchist militias certainly did not do this, and yet the anarchist militias in Aragon were able to force the nationalists back, whereas the other nationalists, uh, they constantly sort of failed to um, gain ground. There were other victories as well, it wasn't as if the anarchists were the only success, but they were the major success, and they actually um, pushed all the way to Aragon, uh, all the way through Aragon to the, the city of Zaragoza, and Zaragoza was quite a key strategic thing, and Daruti and the militia, they wanted to take Zaragoza, but um, uh, they were told not to by the Republican government, and the Republican government refused to use other militias to support um, the, uh, the anarchist militia too much. Uh, and this has partly been attributed because they, they did not want Zaragoza to be collectivised as well, because, of course, uh, many in the Republican government were, of course, uh, owners of property, or at least um, uh, part of the same sort of class and social groups as the members of property, so they did not want Zaragoza to be collectivised. So, um, yeah, the anarchist militia was then told to hold the front, which they did for quite some time. Um... Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, the, they also refused to supply the anarchist militia with any weaponry, so they were very un, uh, um, not well supplied. Um, so now I guess I'll sort of uh, get onto the collectors, which I just managed. Sort of, as I said, they uh, the uh, villages in Aragon were collectivised. This wasn't a forceful collectivization, like. There were probably some instances, because, um, like, sort of in the chaos of the war, there was, like, a lot of violence and sort of personal vengeance, which I personally can't condone, but I'm not, uh, I'm not in a position to condemn, because, uh, for example, the killing of, um, priests and, um, nuns and, um, uh, business owners, um, well, these, these, uh, sort of free groups of people, like, sort of the church and, of course, um, business, uh, the the bourgeoisie, as some would say, uh, played, and the landowners played a large role in oppressing many people. And so, of course, violent tensions got out, and there was the constant fear of treachery. And and in the few places where um, the um, anarchists, well, not even the anarchists, because it was just everyone sort of there in a fit of sort of, I want to say bloodlust, and yeah, I don't think a, a Fit of bloodlust is a good term. I don't think I should really probably be using fit in that term, so I apologise if I've made anyone uncomfortable. It's just sort of learning to deal with this language myself. But, um, this... In the heat of the moment's probably the best thing. On both sides, there were... So, so includes the socialists, the communists, and even, um... Uh, like I said, what would be termed in America nowadays as liberal. Um... There were, there were sort of murders, but um, in the places where, the villages where priests weren't killed, um, in quite a few of them, the priests uh, still, um, as the nationalists regained land, they fly anarchist and socialist organisers to be killed then by the, um, the nationalists, um, which is quite unfortunate, and, but not kill, killing, I, uh, but again, I don't think sort of this would then justify those priests being killed, but I'm just sort of showing that it's a complex situation. But anyway, um, yeah, it was not a forceful collectivization, and um, sort of, so if people wanted, if peasants wanted to, to, who were, like, working with their families maybe, or had a small bit of land, but weren't really employing anyone else, they were allowed to keep their land, and in some cases, the collective that was formed in the village would give them additional land. <laughs> just as sort of, uh, so they could help manage themselves better. But aside from that, um, the different villages were collectivised, so that means um, the, the, the labour uh, and, the, and the land sort of belonged to the, the village, and then uh, all of it would be produced for the village, and then they would just often give food freely to sort of passing militias and stuff, so this helped to keep the militias supplied in the beginning, although there were uh, the, the Republican forces... Never really, and the Republican governments, or even the the strictly anarchist things, but at any sort of stage of the anar uh, the Republican forces, they never really properly arranged for the supply of food to um, the militias or to the later sort of um, 
army. But to begin with, like, food as they, the anarchist militias passed through was given freely to the militias. But, yeah, and a lot of people benefited from this because um, they were then able to sort of, well, you know, access food reliably. And in the different towns, I think it talked about, like, even in the small towns, like, barbers would um, work all through the evenings giving free haircuts. And then, yeah, that was one of the problems they had to overcome, actually, in this one village, I remember. Uh, just a bit of an anecdotal story. Is that everyone was sort of, like, because uh, they would set up committees which were, uh, sort of had recallable delegates. Uh, one thing, actually, I would argue was uh, against if I was sort of in a position to sort of try and persuade people um, during the Spanish Civil War is um, a lot of these committees, although they were made of recallable delegates, they still had administrative power, so that took decision-making kind of out of the hands of the of the people. So it was still kind of anarchistic in that, like, if any of the representatives um, or delegates rather started to act uh, uh, like make but poor decisions they would be um stripped of that power immediately but of course the people weren't involved in direct mistakes though i suppose that wasn't that much of a problem not many people um uh were failed by it and it's certainly better than the typical representative um organization but i think that people would be more involved in decision making and more personally and individually empowered if they directly made these decisions themselves and then the committees were simply admin administrative so simply carried out the policies made by the entire sort of um collective but yeah the collectives they benefited from uh Free, uh, like, yeah, it was sort of talks about, you can find in some sources where they'd um, come together and have these massive feasts because, well, they simply had always been producing at a surplus that was either sold or um, probably destroyed to manage prices. And then they were able to sort of have these um, large celebratory feasts and to just generally live more comfortably and then it was generally a better standard of living because of course also then what uh a lot of the production actually became more efficient under the collectives because instead of let's say uh, ca uh like if it was a capitalist sort of landowner he would not share his tractor or i don't know if tractors were thing but anyway farm equipment with anyone else because of course there's no profit in him for doing that and then if he makes his competitors more successful sharing um uh equipment with them that undermines his own interests. Collectives, of course, there was no sort of profit motive, so equipment did get shared, and it got shared throughout the collectives. So, uh, so then, um, farm equipment was used more efficiently, so it actually went up. Um, and that, that was quite a good thing. I think the, um, thing that I was going to discuss off on a tangent, sorry, this thing is absolutely loaded with tangents so far, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I did say this would be informal. But, um, yeah, is in this one sort of town they had to explain, the committee had to explain to everyone that the bar, uh, the hard work the barbers were doing because they thought the barbers were just sort of slacking off. But that was, of course, because, um, of course, you don't always, you don't just get frequent haircuts all the time. So um, a large populace of the sort of town in the collective, uh, they just assumed the barbers were doing nothing. So then they had to be shown that the barbers were working, although they didn't go to work in the fields, they were working till like... Um, very late into the night cutting people's hairs and then when they saw that they they were fine with it after um the collective different methods like some were full sort of anarcho-communist so they were just sort of uh, from act according to the principle from uh, each according to his ability to each according to his need uh well his uh should probably be replaced with uh there which because yeah i don't want to be <laughs> All, uh, people in previous centuries always said his. You're aware of that, probably. I, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, but <laughs> um, yes, where was I? I'm sorry about these tangents. Um, yeah, so some would be anarcho-communist. Uh, some would be um, what would Peter Kropotkin would call collective wage vouchers. Or not wage vouchers, labour vouchers. So they would have, like, these... Vouchers that would represent, like, oh, I've done, uh, like, two hours of work, 
Um, so I would be entitled to take two hours worth of work. So, like, let's say it took two hours to produce, like, a day's worth of groceries. I would exchange two hours worth of labour vouchers, which I would then receive from the committee, which would, of course, be anarchistic and of uh, recallable delegates. Um, and, or, I, I don't know how else they sort of organised it. I just, uh, they might have a vouchers and then they would be given these vouchers and then they would exchange them for their thing and some places they used money as well still they just kept up with the money and just had everything being collectivized and yeah and of course it would also differ on their relations with other places like so you would have some places that would o uh, operate on a communist uh, principle so everyone just gave and took freely uh, but they would retain some form of uh, currency to interact with um, uh, the uh, nearby towns and collectors that weren't necessarily using this or to you uh, for maybe then dealing with um, sort of uh, foreign exports and imports they would have a currency to use then and so yeah there was a lot of experimentation and it generally worked out quite beneficially uh, in some places, uh, rationing was used, uh, and this depended on the location as well, because uh, of course this was a war effort, so they sort of um, relied on uh, rations to make sure that supplies would be available, even though they actually ended up producing a lot more, but um, uh, yeah, uh, one case I remember from the uh, documentary by uh, that's on Punks for Progress's channel um, is uh, well they they had to sort of people got a bit excited with cigarettes so for a short time they had to ration um, they had to ration cigarettes and alcohol uh, alcohol actually I don't think they actually had to ration because I think people would just take it and they would only drink it at these celebratory events but it, yeah the alcohol was taken freely i think at this one place i can't really remember but they had to ration cigarettes for a while i think eventually the ration was broke and then the main complaints that the people talking about this they were members of the committee reflecting on it of course um they they said uh yeah the main problem was actually their um their own sort of moral reservations because they knew of course cigarettes and cigars are bad for your health yeah it would have been more cigars i think in those days but um yeah, they knew that smoking was bad for your health, so they, they, they felt bad that they um, were giving um, cigarettes to people, but of course they, they weren't being like judgmental, like taking control snobs and being like, no, don't smoke, keep your lungs. We, we, we command you to keep your lungs healthy for the, for the, for the authoritarian anti-smoking hierarchy. But you understand what I mean. That was a very poor joke, I apologise. Um, yeah, of course these, um, I, I, I say that they improved productivity, but unfortunately, as I said, there were problems arranging for the distribution of this food outside of the collectives. And also the collectives weren't the most um, productive areas. Um, this wasn't actually because of a fault of the collectives themselves, it's just simply the majority of the... Um, good cropland, so for growing uh, grains and stuff, uh, that was in nationalist um, controlled territories, because in these areas the, um, the uh, there was uh, a lot more sort of, of the private landlords, the private landlords were a bit, uh, quite a bit bigger and more socially entrenched, and these were in more um, Catholic, conservative areas, so the landowners would uh, sort of suckered up to the nationalists and got the nationalists more secure in these areas and of course because it was a more conservative catholic area as well um the republican was definitely more secular so a few of the more religious peasants in these religious areas they they, they would side with the nationalists as well just to stop the um to sort of preserve the catholic values um but yeah because of this um cropland um imbalance i suppose the republic was always um less well supplied with food than um Germ uh, not germany why am i saying germany um than um the nationalist spain was
And um, another mistake that the, um, well, not just the anarchist collectives, but sort of people all around the Republic did, is they they thought they would need a lot of meat to feed their militias, so they would they, they slaughtered their livestock straight away. So this meant later there there wasn't any livestock on the Republic. Well, there was a greatly reduced number of livestock for later in the war, because they just um, killed the livestock to immediately give food to the militias and the the middle. Uh, yeah, and yeah, the militias were overly well fed. It's I think um, it's described at quite uh at the um earlier stages of the war and actually a lot of food was um wasted so but unfortunately this wasn't the case for the entirety of the war and eventually um yeah food supplies uh went out the anarchist collectives unfortunately were um well yeah i uh, they, there was never any problem and like i said they didn't really have any uh, too many internal issues, but, um, well, yeah, aside from the murders, but the mur murders aren't, like, something that, they're deplorable, I suppose, well, not deplorable, because as I said, I don't want to condemn them, I don't condone the, the murders, but I, I, I can't condemn them, uh, yeah, uh, but they, the, the murders, at any case, they did not actually threaten the stability of the collectives, what's, Destroyed the collectives was, of course, well, as you can guess, um, the advancement of the nationalists, and the nationalists would um, give land back to the landowners and stuff like that. And uh, um, But also, um, uh, the communists, who we'll sort of discuss more, they deliberately um, organised so there would be a, another front through uh, Aragon to push forward to the Ebro. Um, and that was sort of used as a way, so sort of, while it was apparently a sort of military thing, the military is actually, uh, the Republican military, this is, the organised army, was used to um, uh, de-collectivise the majority of the peasant um, collectives. So then after this, sort of, of course, you had the, the, the pr problems again of, like, people not sharing resources effectively and then production went down, and then, of course, land was lost to the nationalists, so it was even more difficult to acquire food. Uh, so that's why the supplies didn't go that well, and that's why the collectives eventually fell. Um, in Barcelona, this is the main bit, yeah, everything was collectivised by the workers, but um, it wasn't sort of as if these were more sort of independent, I isolated. It was a big sort of citywide effort led by the um, CNT, and the um, the CNT, um, they uh, they well yeah as I just said they organised for mass collectivizations because um, a lot of business owners they fled because uh, of uh, course business owners were getting killed uh, during the Republican thing and then when they realised that the unions were in control they they did not want to be in Barcelona anymore so the business owners fled and their empty factories which were just given to um, the uh, the workers, who were mostly members of the CNT. And then, um, the CNT, um, uh, yeah, so where was I? Yeah, so they've been organised into collectives. Uh, the collectivization wasn't universal in Barcelona. The CNT weren't in full control, and they actually, um, they, uh, yeah, they allowed um, the Generalidad, the um, Catalonian government, to still sort of remain. I think, I actually, I'm going to discuss that in another video now and have this video primarily on the militias and the collectivization. But, um, the, uh, yes, so, um, yeah, it, it wasn't like a total um, collectivization. And again, it wasn't a, really a forced collectivization. Like, rich people, like business owners, they were forced to collectivize, and a lot of uh, middle-class businesses were collectivized. And that's actually um, caused the uh, militias, uh, not the militias, the middle classes, to support the communists later, because the communists uh, promised somewhat weirdly to... Um, well, when I say communists, I mean, like, the state communists. So those supporting um, and supported by Starling, um, they um, 
promised not to um, collectivize them, to undo collectivizations. The middle classes supported them and their, the, the communists' attempts to undermine the anarchists and attack them. But uh, yes, and uh, the collectivization wasn't really forced. Like, for example, there was a um, there was some sort of uh, factory or a mill that was not part of the Barcelona Collective because they would sort of federate. So you would have, like, um, the workers in the factory forming, like, sort of one group, and then that group would join with other factories, like the workers of other factories, to form another level, and then they would organise upwards and upwards until you got entire industries organised and stuff like that. And at all points, these groups would be represented by delegates who who were, again, immediately recordable. Some of them did the thing where... Um, they only also said the policies that were already agreed upon. And yeah, also some collectives in the peasant communities in Aragon did that as well. I should have been more clear. But um, again, some did the thing where it was um, recallable delegates, but they still sort of ha had the ability to make uh, legislation. Um, but yeah, they were federate together in this manner. But not all of them, not all factories chose to federate. Like there was this one factory or mill, as I was saying, that it was sort of collectivized, so like the workers continued to, uh, the the workers took ownership of their factory, but they didn't um, federate, part enter into the federation of these groups and the factories, but they 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 instead, I think they still ended up like, um, distributing groups to and for. They just didn't want to be part of the federation, and uh, yeah, so. The collectives in um, Barcelona, it was actually quite effective. Like, for example, they managed to um, set up healthcare for quite a few people. They, uh, most of the doctors weren't part of the CND, uh, and they did not, like, uh, they had to, like, pay, use the collected union funds and the funds of the, uh, the collectivized industries to pay the doctors, but they organized for, like, free healthcare for a lot of the workers, and they did actually... Um, organize the uh, a lot of doctors and nurses into um, sort of uh, collectives. That's probably not the best term for the doctors and nurses, which would then offer free healthcare, and that this was the main sort of medical treatment for um, soldiers during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, well, for Republican soldiers during the Spanish Civil War, along with um, aid from the um, Red Cross, and yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, the hairdressers, they were, and the barbers, they were given, uh, they were organised quite effectively because now they were all sort of federated together. Instead of having a bunch of separate, different workshops, they um, they got acquired one big, large uh, workshop. So that saved a lot of running costs. Uh, so, and then. Um, they were then all under one roof, and then their pay was a lot better as well. And then, not uh, of course they they weren't all like every barber in the um the in the city was under one roof, of course, but more were under the same roof. Like there were there there were different larger buildings instead of there were fewer but larger buildings, but not just one few what not just one large building, but there were fewer larger buildings as opposed to many smaller buildings, which saved on running costs and it allowed the uh, Barbers to discuss more frequently and stuff, and they um, lowered the costs of haircuts and they raised the wages of the barbers. A lot of workers got pensions as well. I think that they, the the pensions thing is across industries. And then yeah, they actually had um, as George Orwell notes, like um, it sort of they had notices explaining that the the um, barbers were no longer like subservient, and then uh, like it was it was quite cool like that. Um, uh, the other industry that always gets mentioned is the um, the railroad sort of tram system. And uh, this was one of the few industries where they actually didn't equalise pay. Like, because in most of the collectives, like in Barcelona, like the collectivised workplaces, the pay was equalised. But in the tram systems, they didn't. But uh, technicians were still paid more than just uh, workers, unfortunately. By... Um, but they uh, managed to, um, I think this was because they needed to attract technicians from other areas or, or non-anarchist um, technicians. Because I think the technicians were mostly 
um, as opposed to like just the railway workers who were under the CNT. I think the majority of the technicians were socialists under the, um, I want to say the UGT. Um, so they needed to sort of be bribed, unfortunately. Uh, but yes, um, they uh, the collective there, they, they um, managed to, um, well, they repaired most of the trams, w which were like in very bad condition, and most of them had been shot up and stuff, especially during the thing, but they repaired them all, and the... Um, yeah, they lowered fares, they ra raised the wages of every worker within the um, tram railway industry, and they, um, yeah, the trams were lower fares and more punctual than they'd ever been before. So that's another thing that I think, because people, it's reported in a lot of these things, like workers would just um, sort of out of their own volition, stay up really late, work ridiculously long hours and hard simply because they were just so invested in their work now that they had control over it and of course there was the um fascist threat which they were very passionately against and with many of these workers having actually fought the fascists during the um attempted coup in barcelona so that was quite a successful story the textile industry was also uh bolstered its uh production and was very successful uh, production in all areas of Republican Spain, um, production fell because, um, it became more difficult for them to receive, um, uh, foreign imports of, um, goods to process, and, of course, it became more difficult to export goods to sell, uh, simply because of the nature of how wars work. So, production dropped all the way, so that's why it's a bit misleading, because some of the ones they'll be like, oh yeah, the textiles industries were the most sort of productive, but no, they, they, they were, the collective f uh, factories and stuff, they were p the most, they became more productive, but relative to their situation, so compared to uh, like other industries and uh, non-collectivized areas, and uh, what would be expected if they hadn't been collectivized, they, they were still more productive. And I think, actually, one of the most sort of impressive feats that they, they managed to do was um, there were no munitions factories or anything like that in Republican Spain, or at least in Barca in Catalonia. So I think it was like they rep uh, did um, over at least over 100, or I, I, I don't actually want to quote a number, but uh, many, many um, factories, yeah, it would have been 200, over 200, I think. Um, 200 factories they converted to um, the production of uh, munitions, and of course they, they did this within a period of a couple of, uh, it, within weeks, as opposed to like the, the normal length of time that it would take, simply because the workers were just really dedicated to their goal, empowered in that they had control of their workplaces, and they... Um, they, uh, yes, they, um, they, um, set up the, uh, munitions factories, and then that became the Republicans' main source of, uh, like, um, munitions, the sort of, um, grenades and bullets and stuff, Aside from the, um, sort of, or well, I, I don't know how it really compares, but they, the, the Republican did, uh, the Republic did also receive arms from, some small shipments of arms from Mexico. Mexico, uh, wanted to, provided as much as it could, I suppose, as much as it could spare. And then um, from the um, USSR, which did not provide as much as it could, because, um, yeah, uh, but a lot of this, as I said, the aid uh, that was foreign aid um, did not get sent to the anarchist militias, but was sort of kept by the um, Republic's sort of proper army and by the um, communists. Um, yeah, so the Barcelona Collective sort of fell because, um, again, uh, for reasons that we may discuss another time, the communists were able to seize power through um, political manipulations. Yeah, I, I think I can briefly explain. I won't go into it too long. The communists were initially quite a small party, but they were the only ones with direct connections to the USSR, and the USSR was the only country that was willing to supply aid to the um, Republicans.
because the uh, the other sort of uh, countries such as Britain and France did not want to support the Republicans because they did not want to accidentally start another wo- another world war with um, uh, Italy and Germany who were um, sort of not semi like discreetly supporting the nationalists and they wanted to sort of keep this as a neutral sort of battleground and sort of distract from any tensions that could cause a war they didn't want to invite an opportunity to cause a war so they stayed they stayed out of it as part of sort of chamberlain sort of well i don't think chamberlain was the one when it started but um a part of their appeasement to the fascist nations so the ussr was the only one who was willing to aid and then, uh, so most of the aid that came in went to the Communist Party, was part of the, the Communists' um, Comintern. Well, no, was Comintern? No, Comintern's different. Ignore me. Just, yeah, Comintern's completely different. Um, the Communist International, anyway. So Stalin, yeah, yeah they became more powerful because of that, because of um, direct supplies, and then they were also given gradually more and more power within the Republican government and the Republican state. Um, as the result of them being the the, the link to uh, the desperately needed war supplies and aid, especially with the, well, I say the international brigades, but the international brigades, they were impressive and they were a good sort of show of aid. And I don't want to downplay what they did or the people who sort of went there generally out of the genuine pureness of their heart to sort of help what they saw to be a good cause and risk their lives, but they weren't actually very militarily important. They didn't, like, achieve any decisive victories. But, yeah, because uh, of this disp- uh, dependency on the um, USSR, the USSR-backed communists gained much more power. And as I uh, mentioned, the um, well, basically what happened, the Republican government and the communists as well as the, because at some point the socialists took control of the government uh, uh, through elections, and, well, I think they were granted the power of the rest of the popular front, because um, the UGT, it was smaller in Catalonia, but it was bigger across France than the anarchist CNT, so the, and the anarchists initially refused to join the government, um, so the CGA t- took power, and then the, the CG, uh, so yeah, the socialists, and the communists and the other republicans they had a policy of sort of oh we'll have a revolution but we need to beat the um nationalists first whereas the anarchists and the p-o-u-m or the poom uh as it can sort of be said they they had sort of this policy of or this idea that um having the revolution was part of beating the fascists and that the two should be done simultaneously um so uh yeah um and then uh so the the communists were already powerful in government and they did a bunch of stuff they even underplayed the um socialist party which was the main sort of power by sort of they um took over the socialist youth organization and yeah uh of course they they also were the main source of because with that, international brigades also came um, military experts and planes and a few pilots from Russia directly. So, of course, again, that boosted their influence. But um, another part of support for the um, communists was, as I mentioned, the uh, middle classes who did not like the idea of collectivization, which um, the communists were deliberately putting off as part of the, um, their rhet- rhetoric of oh, we'll do the revolution, uh, we'll focus on beating the nationalists and then have a revolution. So they promised to sort of undo a lot of collectivization, and they managed to pressure the um, anarchists and, uh, who were sort of negotiating and I think did form eventually a part of the Catalonian government to undo um, collectivization. And then eventually they, uh, after what was called the sort of May Day sort of events, where um, uh, after the there was sort of the telecommunications like the te- telephone sort of tower, which was still collectivized, the um communist forces their sort of assault guards they stormed it, and attempted to take it, which uh, resulted in large scale fighting between the anarchists, and the um. And the um uh, communists, 
and the Anarchist was severely weakened by this, and the um, Poom was pretty much totally suppressed by this. And then so um, most industries were decollectivized, and then the few that remain collectivized were um, abandoned or destroyed as the, um, the Nationalists eventually won the war and um, seized Barcelona. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I, I think like a lot of the problems um, that resulted in the destruction, it's one of these cases where they were external as opposed to internal problems. Uh, there were internal mistakes made, like, um, yeah, like for example, where the anarchists eventually felt pressured to join the government. I do not think they should have done that. And in fact, the CNT um, agreed that it never should have sent re uh, representatives to the meetings, and this included people who had been members of the government. And they uh, sort of, after the fascists took over in sort of exile, the CNT sort of agreed to never ever put anyone, uh, it's like a policy they have now, they agreed to never to put anyone into office again. Because the problem wasn't so much um, uh, corruption, the problem was that uh, they, the, the people in government, they had to constantly focus on their position in government and dealing with governmental um, bureaucratic problems and they were out of connection, uh, they were out of touch with the workers, so a lot of the CNT workers on the grounds they felt betrayed at times by the people who took government. And then the other thing that was possibly a mistake is that, as I said, the anarchists sort of had control of Barcelona, but they allowed the um, the Catalonian government to remain after the Catalonian president made an appeal to them. Uh, they, they did have a logic to allowing it to remain, because first, although they had the majority, they weren't like the entirety of Barcelona, so if they tried to abolish the state straight then, that could have caused fighting, which would have distract infighting, which would have um, distracted from the war effort, especially as the militias are just sort of headed out to the front, they didn't want to then send them straight back and sort of divert their attention. And then also, they they wanted, uh, they thought by doing so they would get better treatment for anarchists in other locations. Uh, in hindsight, I would say this was probably a mistake and they probably should have just uh, risked um, getting rid of the um, uh, Catalo uh, Catalonian government entirely and just having things work as own and run and sort of by the sort of in the syndicalist fashion but I have the benefit of hindsight of course and yeah I think a lot of that's actually based on stuff that turned out which they might have not necessarily expected. My main problem with it was that the vote they had about it, it was very rushed and um, it was sort of uncounted, it, it was possibly sort of counted in a very unfair way like they only allowed a very brief discussion and then uh, as sort of the discussion was going on the people who supported the idea of allowing the government to remain they were grouping their sort of followers during the discussion so of course you then see the groups of people all supporting it and then you might be feel more pressured to um, vote in favor of keeping the government so that this affected the vote quite much and I feel like even if they just drew out the discussion for a couple of days even. I think there was time for that. And then that would have maybe m allowed for a more informed, more fair decision to be made. But aside from that, like I think the main causes of the anarchist failures were simply... Um, they, they had no sort of external support, unlike the um, nationalists who received extensive um, military aid from... Uh, fascist Germany and fascist Italy and uh, from different uh, rich businesses across the road uh, across the world and who had the best trained army and uh, the most important sort of naval bases. The Republican sailors, they um, stopped their officers from mutinying and uh, often killed or imprisoned their mutinous officers. But although the Navy itself stayed loyal to the Republic, um, most uh, of the important naval locations uh, were seized by the uh, nationalists, as well as um, quite a few important ships were seized by the nationalists. But yeah, so the nationalists sort of had the immediate military advantage and the immediate sort of advantage of the best crop land 
and the advantage of foreign aid. So I think this is why the nationalists really beat the um, beat the republic, which was sort of the republic in general was isolated, and then it became overly dependent on the um, communists, and then because of this sort of not wanting collect collectivization to occur, the anarchists. Uh, never even received much of the aid that was then sent from the Soviet Union. So, um, th I think the main sort of cause for uh, the anarchist sort of failure was external as opposed to internal um, conditions as seen by sort of um, the, uh, the, the fact that most of the uh, working conditions in the collectors were made much better and thus the general success of the anarchist militia on the Aragon front. One criticism that's been raised um, was, and this wasn't just to the anarchist militia, was maybe, but something that could be related to anarchist, is that um, work, uh, the soldiers in the militias would sometimes insist upon voting upon their orders, but... I haven't actually seen uh, uh, any examples given on why this is overly problematic. Because when I say they were voting on orders, this was more so like orders that were given as part of a broad strategy, not like sort of like everyone quickly being told to like, take cover! And then and they, they, they sort of go, no, we need to discuss whether or not we need to take cover. <laughs> it was more so sort of like, oh, okay, tomorrow we're going to go to such and such and advance on such and such. That was the stuff they voted upon. Uh, but... Um, yeah, uh, I, I haven't actually seen, uh, th th this was mainly from, like, the main complaints I've seen this raised from, that it was first-hand accounts from the communists and a few of the uh, socialists, and they, of course, were very much for a hierarchical system, so they, they may have just assumed that to be a problem, and I'd, I, uh, but, yeah. So I don't think being decentralised too much actually affected the anarchist militia's fighting capacity, and I think any sort of failures that did occur were the fact that these were mostly untrained men, or hastingly, hast rapidly, um, unprofessionally trained men against um, well-experienced, um, constantly trained uh, soldiers. And I, I shouldn't really say men, because uh, for the in regards to the militias, because women did uh, fight um, during the uh, for the Republicans in the militias. Apparently this was, uh, according to Orwell, this was more of a phenomenon or an, an, an occurrence. I don't think I pronounced the first word <laughs> correctly. But this was more of an occurrence during the um, earlier parts of the war with uh, women eventually, unfortunately, coming home to uh, be more, like, do their more traditional roles. But I'm not actually too sure how accurate Orwell's claim is because I've read uh, as part of the stuff that was recommended by um, so, uh, socialism or barbarism. I've read, like, quite much about the... Um, women sort of being quite heavily involved throughout the war effort. Uh, although, unfortunately, at a lot of places they were then forced to do domestic work for the militias on top of their fighting duties until I think a few of them uh, raised this up and then the duties did get shared more equitably. There was a specific um, organisation within the CNT and the militias that did a lot to sort of raise women's rights and then in the republic in general women's rights were much better than they had been before because um for example abortions were legalized and other things that uh and they were given other other liberties like the it was the republic that uh the progressives in the republic that gave the um women the right to vote even though um that wasn't actually a politically strategic move because the majority of women who had been held in these traditional uh, roles held, of course, quite strong political values and were very supportive of um, of the more conservative Catholics. So that allowed, actually, the right wing to um, get a lot of support in the Republican Parliament. But I suppose I've rambled enough, so... And I might do another video to sort of discuss more, maybe, the Civil War in general, or maybe more of sort of the anarchist sort of politics. But... Um, during the Civil War, but yes, um, so I apologise for the many tangents that I've gone on, and I've probably forgotten stuff that I've started multiple times throughout this uh, thing, and I, uh, but as I said, this would have, I, I've always planned for this to be relatively informal, 
and uh, I welcome your feedback as always. Just leave a comment below, um, and then yeah, uh, this includes criticisms. Try to keep your criticisms like nice. Like I, I don't mean like cushion it or anything, but I mean like try to keep it so I can actually understand what the criticism is and uh, work on actually improving it because that's what I want to do. But I thank you for your effort in writing anything really. So yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll probably see you in another video then, or you can find me on my blog, which is the same name as my channel. See you.